All right, thank you so much all for coming uh, today to a slightly different version of the uh, weekly SESTA seminars. Um, I'm particularly excited about today because um, for the first time, we have two members of our uh, graduate certificate in digital humanities cohort um, who have gone through the whole program. They've, they've been here since its inception and, uh, and have completed all the steps um, and are, are finalizing their participation in the certificate uh, through their capstone presentations today. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with it, the Graduate Certificate in Digital Humanities uh, is a, a program within SESTA that attempts to institutionalize the kinds of training that many of the graduate students um, who work with SESTA in its various labs and groups already uh, uh, receive. Uh, but, but with the Graduate Certificate, uh, we've given them a plan, we hope, uh, to formalize their education in digital humanities, um, and uh, and hopefully a very nice certificate at the end that will speak to the work that they've done as members of the SESTA community. Um, it's also very nice. I was I was talking with Cameron Blevins, who was here for a visit yesterday, who asked me about the graduate certificate in digital humanities, and it made me remember um, a a heady conversation we had around an outside picnic table uh, outside Godzilla Modular in summer of 2013, which is where the certificate program. Uh, first emerged as an idea. And I'm excited that it's blossomed and, and grown into, I think, the two fantastic presentations we'll see here today. Uh, so since I don't want to break up the flow, I will just introduce both of our presenters uh, at the beginning. And I should say again, I'm particularly excited that it's <coughs> two that are presenting because I've had the pleasure of seeing their projects uh, develop from fairly early stages into what they will be showing you. Day. So first up, we have Chloe Edmondson, who will be uh, presenting French Salons in the Age of Enlightenment, um, a project that she's been working on, um, directed through the Graduate Certificate Program by Dan Edelstein, um, and, and uh, a project that, that weaves together a lot of threads that have come from uh, the Mapping the Republic of Letter uh, project, but in a wholly new form that is entirely uh, Chloe's own. And after Chloe, we will have uh, Rachel Madura, who will be presenting Publishing the Press Post. Sorry, <laughs> Publishing the Post, um, another project that weaves together elements of, of projects that have happened in the past in SESTA, but again, in a form that I think will be uh, both surprising and, and very interesting to the uh, assembled audience. Um, uh, Rachel has been directed in her graduate certificate life by uh, Giovanna Cesarini, who is uh, here today. Cesarani, sorry, who is here today. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Chloe and the uh, bubble. Hey, good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm very excited to present this project here today, a project that was born at SESTA about four or maybe even five years ago. I just lost track. Um, I was asked to briefly explain the origins of the project, so I will do that before getting into the research. <coughs> As some of you know, I've been working in various capacities on mapping the Republic of Letters with Dan Edelstein for several years now. And it is through our research team, Procope, that I started collaborating on the Salons project with Melanie Conroy, who is now assistant professor of French at the University of Memphis. At the time, I was writing my undergraduate honors thesis on 18th century French Salons, and Melanie asked me to be co-project lead on the Salons project, which we have been working on together ever since. So if I can call it my project today, it is very much thanks to the collaborative ethos that is fostered here at SESTA. The idea behind the project is that we cannot answer the question of what the salons in the Enlightenment were without asking who attended the salon. We want to provide a more realistic and accurate picture of French salons through a data-driven demographic approach. This project compares the social, knowledge, and professional networks of 18th century salons in Paris. In the study, we analyzed the demographics of six prominent salons based on the largest data set yet available, examining patterns within the salon world as well as the particularities of individual salons. By eventually making our data and our data model public, we hope to 
create a framework for future studies of the swans and their role in the Enlightenment as researchers correct and expand the database. Today, although this work will not be a part of my dissertation, the salons have maintained a firm grip on me. Melanie and I are in the process of submitting this article for publication, and I'm also currently writing a chapter exclusively on one of the salons for a volume that I'm co-editing with Dan, entitled Networks of European Enlightenment. And lastly, I will also be participating um, on a roundtable at the MLA next year on the salons. So clearly, I'm still very much working on this. Um, so to get into the research, one of the most famous depictions of the salons is this painting, An Evening with Madame Geoffrin by Anissé Charles de Gabriel Le Monnier, painted in 1812. This painting is a fantastical reimagining of Enlightenment sociability. Many of the people depicted never attended Madame Geoffrin's salon, and they were certainly not all together at the same time. Yet Le Meunier, like many commentators on the salons, was more interested in memorializing Geoffrin's salon as an Enlightenment institution than in recording a historic event, a problem that has continued to plague historiography of the salon today. In this paper, we propose that a similar sort of reimagining is often at work in the scholarly debates over the characteristics that define French salons. The salon in the 18th century, for those of you who would like a refresher, was a social gathering hosted in a domestic space at a fixed weekly time. Once you had been granted an invitation by the salon hostess or been presented there by a regular attendee, it became an open invitation. The salons arguably constituted the defining institution of the Enlightenment, but they can also be considered a miniature court and a central institution of the Ancien Régime. This dual nature, both enlightened and aristocratic, is a source of debate. Antoine Lusty emphasizes the pervasiveness of practices that he refers to as mondain or worldly. According to this view, salons were not primarily literary or philosophical institutions, but rather institutions of aristocratic sociability, centered around a range of activities, from theater to games, gambling, and gossip. For others, notably Dina Goodman, the salons were core institutions of the Enlightenment and centers of knowledge production. Accounts of the salons often aim to prove that they were of one nature, whether extensions of the court, aristocratic gathering places, proto-feminist spaces, or the milieu that gave rise to the public sphere. What's more, in the current scholarship on the salons, there are many inconsistencies between accounts with respect to the social compositions of given salons, as well as a lack of specificity. There are, in some cases, huge divergences between what authors choose to emphasize with regards to what social groups were present and dominant in the salons. And yet, these differences of emphases, whether an author just emphasizes the political elite versus the nobility versus the feudal sub, paint vastly different pictures of the overall tenor of a salon. What these inconsistencies highlight is that everyone is interested in what social groups were attending the salons in the Enlightenment and which held a dominant influence. But no one is actually pointing to demographic data, or at least they're not making that clear in their work or making the data available. This leads us to some of our central research questions. What was the social composition of the leading Parisian salons? Who participated in these salons, and can we qualify this participation? The aim of our project is to provide a more accurate picture of French salons based on demographic data, so that we can better respond to whether or not 18th century salons participated more fully in the Enlightenment or in the court's culture of the Ancien Régime. There are two novel elements of our methodologies that merit explanation. One is our use of recent biographies to construct samples of documented attendees of salons. One of the biggest problems about studying the salons is the fact that there are no archives of salon attendance, and so it is not possible to reconstruct the complete networks of salons, unlike, for example, academies or universities. Biographers have already grappled with many of the problems of false and partial documentation, drawing on memoirs, personal letters, and anecdotes in other sources. To our knowledge, biographies of salon hostesses are therefore the most accurate and thorough of the available sources from a demographic perspective, despite being necessarily incomplete, which I'll also note that the problem of incomplete data is something that 
goes beyond Salon to many of the things that we study in the digital humanities, even um, epistolary uh, correspondence. There are tons of letters that have been lost in, in throughout time. Another novel element of our method is our use of the concept of the network to simplify a complex system of social connections, reducing group membership to a simple in or out measure. For the sake of our study, any individual who is documented as attending a salon even once is considered to be in the network, regardless of their frequency of attendance. We do not claim that individuals who attended the salon knew one another, but rather that they were more likely to have known one another than people who did not attend the same salon. In our study, a demographic approach allows us to remain at least provisionally agnostic about the nature and function of these salons. <coughs> to create our data set, we thus collected the names of members of each salon from the most up-to-date, reliable biographies. So we considered first who attended the salons and second, their interests. Next, we added further metadata following a similar schema to the one employed in our project on the French Enlightenment Network with Dan Edelstein, Maria Comza, and Claude Willan. We assigned members of salons to networks, so nobility, court, military, letters, sciences, networks that represent individuals' social circles and documented interests, thus individuals who would have likely moved in similar circles outside of the salons. And as you see, each network includes a, a very wide breadth of types of people and their occupations and their interests. <coughs> Finally, we calculated the percentages of these networks in each salon. As you see here, the numbers do not add up to 100% because one person can appear in many networks. So for example, a literary noblewoman like Madame de Jondis is counted in nobility, elite, and letters. The first major debate that we address is how aristocratic the salons really were. We found that nobility made up between one third and almost two thirds of the atten attendees named in biographies of salon hostesses. The elite, which includes both noble and non-noble prominent individuals in society, represented a majority in all but Graffini's salon, which made sense given that her salon was a bit of a flop because she was unable to attract enough A-listers. <laughs> The world of letters was also well represented, making up between one third to two thirds of the documented members of salons. But these Jean Doulet, published authors, writers of significant correspondence, major um, salon hostesses, were by no means an isolated group. Indeed, as you see here, 42% of the Jean Doulet in these salons were elites, and 30% were titled nobility. What our study highlights is that all leading salons were composed of both noble and literary publics. Moreover, many of the nobles and the Jean Doulet were one and the same people. There was thus enough overlap of elite and noble individuals active in the world of letters that the salon world cannot be easily divided into separate camps. Another debate that arises frequently is the number and influence of women within the salon. Women generally constituted, we found, about 15 to 30 percent of the members of a salon. Between one third and two thirds of these women were noble. Unsurprisingly, all the salons had more aristocratic women and elite women than they had women engaged in literature, despite the presence of salon hostesses and a few published female authors. This suggests that women were admitted to salons based on their social position, whether or not they were active in literature. Despite their small numbers, women, specifically the salon hostesses, wielded significant sociocultural influence, notably as mediators helping men get elected to academies and gain roles in the government. Some salons have been considered antechambers to the academies with considerable influence in elections for vacant seats. In particular, Tonsin and Espinasse salons are often considered the gatekeepers to the academies. We found that between 20% and 45% of the members of salons were members of academies. This high proportion of academy members in the salons indicates that salons played a very important role in elections to the academies. Our data indicates that Grafignies had a much smaller percentage of academy members relative to the other salons. Nespinas and Necker had about the same proportion of members of the major academies as Pensin, nearing 50%. Despinas also had the highest proportion of members of the Académie Française. 
This is unsurprising given her close relationship with D'Alembert, who was her housemate and thus omnipresent at her salon. Whatever influence these women did have in getting the guests of their salons elected, the salon hostesses clearly had many contacts with men who went on to be elected to the academies. Throughout the 18th century, we see that the elite academies and the salons were deeply intertwined. Another major source of scholarly debate is what did people discuss in the salons? There are no records of salon conversations, so we will never know exactly what was discussed. We decided to examine instead the publication records of the salon participants and their membership in the academies to determine what their documented interests were. We classified salon members into knowledge networks, as you saw in one of the previous slides, or intellectual groupings of individuals with shared interests who may likely have known each other outside the salons. These knowledge networks, we contend, also help to illuminate the overall tenor of a salon, since regular attendees were publicly identified as having these interests through publications or academic affiliations. While a high proportion of philosoph does not prove that the salon was philosophical, an absence of philosoph would strongly suggest that philosophy was not a central preoccupation of a given salon, and the same goes for the sciences, etc. Some knowledge networks we found had a very stable presence in the major salons. Unsurprisingly, the letters network, which contains all the published authors, is the largest network, comprising more than half of the members of the Spinazes and Necaire salons. The Sciences Network was marginal compared to those engaged in literature, despite its presence in all the salons. Moreover, half of the men of sciences were also in the Letters Network. This suggests that literary topics were the social glue between the majority of the regular salon attendees, constituting a bridge both between producers of knowledge across fields, as well as a bridge between the gens de lettres and the gens du monde. The encyclopédistes were actually present in all six salons in our study. Even in Defense Salon, who has the reputation of being anti-philosophical, there were political economists and philosophes um, present, despite being in smaller numbers. Members of the political economy network, writers on topics such as economics, sociology, and political theory, were far more common in the Spinas and Nickel salons compared to Cassini's and Sansan's. Numbers of encyclopedistes grew substantially throughout the century, from 8% in Gaffigny and Geoffrin salons to 22% in Nicaise. What then changed between Geoffrin's salon, which was receptive to the philosophes but in smaller numbers, and Lespinas and Nicaise's more political or philosophical salons? It's not, as we have seen, the social composition of the salons, which is fairly stable throughout the decades. It is rather the proportion of Yusuf and their allies. The Spinas had the highest number of encyclopedistes, which again is unsurprising given her close relationship with D'Alembert. Compared to Geoffrin Salon, the Spinas also had more men working in government and diplomacy, however, suggesting a greater interest in politics than earlier salons. The Spinaza Salon attracted more government officials and also similar numbers of nobles and literary types. These trends suggest that the High Enlightenment had, and high society coexisted happily in salons like Les Spinazas. To determine how open salons were to the philosoph, we also examined whether or not members of the elite salons corresponded with major enlightened figures. We consider this correspondence, when coupled with salon attendance and also academic affiliations, to suggest at the very least openness to conversations about philosophy and an association with philosophy. The correspondence of major Enlightenment figures are always present in the most elite salons. But the high presence of, of acquaintances of the major figures of the Enlightenment, again, is something that differentiates Lespinas and Necaire salons. The Spinas and Necker had the highest proportion of correspondence of major Enlightenment figures, even of correspondence of Voltaire, which is surprising because of the large age difference between uh, Voltaire and these younger women. The presence of these older acquaintances of Voltaire is indicative of the importance of philosophy in these two high Enlightenment salons. 
While their salons have the reputation of being some of the, quote, civil working spaces of the Project of Enlightenment, there was also debate as to whether or not their salons were places where philosophes had light conversations or places of serious philosophical discussion. So what our data shows is at the very least, their guests were serious whether or not their conversation was. So from our study of the demographics of these elite Parisian salons, we can draw a few conclusions. Some of the common presuppositions of the histories of salons do not hold up to scrutiny. For instance, the demographic data indicates that not all salons had comparable involvement with the academies. With respect to social networks, our study demonstrates that the social composition of the salon world remained relatively stable over the course of the 18th century. The clearest picture that emerges is of a fundamentally mixed public. Liberals were consistently present in large numbers along with other elites. Enlightenment era Parisian salons were thus institutions of elite sociability that missed the literary elite with an aristocratic public that consistently included some women and never excluded the pseudo stuff. All six of these leading Parisian salons were at least open to, to the pseudo stuff and to their allies. There was also, however, an increasing number of pseudo stuff and their allies in the eminent salons in the later half of the 18th century, so in the High Enlightenment. What we see in these salons is what we call a gradual professionalization of the salons. We see increases in the number of published authors, increases in the number of academy members, and also of encyclopédistes. We see far more members of the salons writing for the encyclopédie and also publishing literary books. <laughs> While, of course, there is a chronological dimension to this, with the first volumes of the encyclopédie being published in 1751, there is nonetheless a marked demographic difference between the salons in the early Enlightenment and those in the High Enlightenment. As the members of the salons became more accomplished in scholarly circles, they also became more political. It appears that the interests of the regular salon attendees changed even as the social composition remained relatively the same. Those interested in politics and philosophy gradually took over the salon world as they grew in social prominence. The significant correlation in our data between philosoph, academy membership, and correspondence with major Enlightenment figures points to the emergence of a new genre of salon with a more philosophical penchant. Without necessarily expressly fostering philosophical activity, we just conclude that elite French salons were at the very least meeting places for those most intimately involved in the project of the Enlightenment. Thank you. Are we doing questions or should I questions skip now? So I have a question. Um, as is clear from the data there, there are large differences in the number of people attending these columns. How did you deal with that as a phenomenon? So that is actually something that we are still dealing with, um, which is part of why this project continues to linger on. So we recently found a lot more data for Dufon, which was one of our which was one of our points of concern actually um, throughout the project. And so now we need to clean that data and incorporate it into the findings. But one the, re the reason that this wasn't too big of an issue was that at the at the end of the day this really is a sample. And so what, what we're interested in is seeing kind of the proportions um, within the sample. But we're definitely happy that we found some more data to increase uh, default and get a better look at that. And so your sense is in general these um, salons were around the same size, even though you don't know all the members? I, mean, I think that it's one of the, the issue too with the salons is that, of course, there were some members that came every week and some that only came a couple times. And so we, we can't really know that for sure, but we know, for example, um, Geoffrey, that data is, I think, some of the best that we have. But, but you know, there were hundreds of people going to sal salons okay. uh, throughout throughout their existence. So it's it's difficult to to know exactly. But what we're interested in is really seeing just kind of a representative sample, the way that in the social sciences they'll study, you know, 50 people and then make conclusions about some some aspect of their psyche or something. Okay. Thanks. 
Um, I had a question about an interesting trend that um, maybe that you didn't touch on, but might be another part of your research, which is that it seems as though nobles start to write more over the course of the, so it's not just that, I mean, so that's a kind of funny, I mean, the interaction effect, which you helpfully brought out here is an interesting one, because maybe the salons, part of it is that the salons are having more writers, and part of it is that the elite is just writing, is publishing more, mm -hmm. so that they enter into the kind of the interaction term there. Why would that be, and what would be the story you'd want to tell about that? And that's a good question. It's something that has uh, we've recently been focusing on more and more, and I think it's also um, an interesting trend that allows us to find a middle way between Lindsay and Goodman in that scholarly debate, because you, what you find is that so many were, were, one, were the same people, and so there isn't this divide between the um, you know, these salons that were the motors of the Enlightenment versus these salons that were just for the entertainment of the aristocracy. But it was rather this um, this interaction. And I think it's actually also very much in line with our findings in um, our article, The French Enlightenment Network, with uh, Dan, Maria, Melanie, and uh, Claude Milan, because we see that there it, there, it, there isn't this divide. It's actually a, a significant number of the, of the aristocrats throughout are engaging actively in the world of letters. Uh, so this was great. Um, <clears throat> how do you deal with foreign um, visitors? <clears throat> I mean, were you calculating that? So, I mean, it, Geoffrey was famous for sort of being the point of entry for foreigners. So are they included in this data? They are included. Um, we also actually recently got a lot more Geoffrey data of all of her Polish visitors. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we need to incorporate that into this as well. It might be interesting to compare the numbers with the foreigners and without to see if there's any significant difference there. Right, right, definitely. I think the that. difficult part is that it's hard to know with the foreigners if like how foreign they were, they, because some of them just come to visit Paris and they go to a few salons and then they leave, whereas others are kind of having Paris as a, as a home base for a long time. So right. I think that's also an issue. Right. I had a question about, um, I mean, this is also great and, and wonderful, but uh, one, uh, one point about the academy, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I find it very compelling how you said they, um, what emerges from this data is a sense that belonging to a salon is conducive or, or puts you into a network that might facilitate mm -hmm. and actually into the academy. And uh, I just like, so one is, uh, I wonder if one, one um, which I want to ask you a second question about, but the first question is like, well, could one say, well, is it the opposite thing? Like, uh, where, how, how are you sure that this is what's happening? Because from the data, one could say, could it be that instead of being in an academy makes you more likely to to be in the salon? And maybe you have a, and maybe there's a simple answer to that. But then I also wondered, um, is there a, at least a curiosity more in general? Like because for the academies, instead, I guess you have to find this and accountability, and then. So I think that would be part of the answer. How many people from the academy of these academies belong to these uh, salons or not? And then it's also a question of time, then? because it's like if if your point is um, is true, it's one person in the salon and then goes into the academy. And I wonder, like visually, how would that uh, you would deal with that? And I can see that it, it, there is not a time that natural by that, which is already right. Well, I do think, um, as, as you say, of course, some members of the academy would be more likely to be attending these salons. But I think there's also um, a lot of there's a lot of uh, evidence that the salon hostesses played an important played, they played an important role in actually kind of planning these elections, and you see you see that in their correspondence actually. So Judy de Espinas, for example, in her correspondence, that you see her discussing you know these academy elections, and especially in I think especially in the Espinas salon, which had so many also the and Dan Lambert with the the Condal Perpetuel of the academy, you see this um, they there there's this kind of core group of people that are trying to plan, you know, well, okay, who's going to get elected? And then it's also a, going to the salons was really a place of social networking. So you see that it's, that's where you meet the other academy members if you're kind of an up and coming writer. And that's where you, you gain access to the kind of the patronage of the, of the elite. So clarification, when you say in an academy, you mean a royal academy, right? Not a provincial academy. Right, right. And Tonsin Salon was, I mean, famously, that was the, where this all began. Right, so you see a comparable numbers with Tonsin and Espinas. Just a quick follow-up on that. Um, there's, I mean, there are some pretty 
distinctive uh, periods here, right? I mean, Tulsa wasn't really running uh, at the same time as Miss Pinas, yeah. right? She was like starting in the 20s or... Mm -hmm. um, so do you have some charts sort of showing like when these settles are... It might be interesting to do yeah. a kind of, you know, like priestly diagram. Right, right. That. No, that would be, I think that, that could be helpful. I think for us, if we're so close to the data in our heads, we right. kind of, we know that, but I think it would be helpful to have a diagram of that. Yes, Nicole? Um, just to follow on that and, and what Giovanna was bringing up, I was curious too, if, if, if you're pursuing more temporal aspects, because it seems like both, it's you know it's academy membership publication um, when these th the moment the, t the moments in time when these um, evidence appears in correspondence all of that seems like that could be extremely helpful to deepen the analysis is that something that you've been looking at as well or do you not consider it necessarily relevant? Are you, so you mean the the time frame of it? Yeah, time frame for all of these different elements. You're you're. You're pulling your evidence right from a number of different sources, and so I'm wondering how you can um, <coughs> extract even more by considering the temporal dimension. If you look at publication, well, when were these things published? When? Um, what, what are these moments in time that that um, distinguish um, an individual, maybe in their career, and how does that overlap with their membership in the song? Or I realize membership is problematic because you can't really say that, but nonetheless, it, there might be some interesting evidence, right, that you could pull. Right, no, and I think that actually it's one of those things where we've, we've been shying away a bit from the temporal dimension mm -hmm. for, the, for the reason that we can't know with much of our data, you know, especially, you know, how often people went to Sloan, when exactly they were going, and so I think that we've been trying to take almost a bird's eye view to just look at the, the demographic data because we can't deal with the temporal data in terms of the actual attendees, but I do think in terms of publication, that would be an interesting way to look at to look at that. But then there's also the thorny issue of what well, we can't necessarily know because there's a lot of overlap in the times. I mean, they are somewhat distinct, but a lot of these slugs were still, you know, existing around the same time. Where you know, one is at the tail end and another is getting started. So it's it's hard to deal with that temporal dimension when we lack the specific data of the attendees. I wonder for some of these individuals, if you had the correspondence data, if you could at least narrow it down when they were actually in Paris, mm -hmm. um, that might help provide a bit more limitation. Right, 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 that's true. Um, the database has about 600 people, so it's also, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, that's another issue is that, you know, it's, it's a fairly large database, and so then it's, well, how, and we kind of, we also constructed it completely from scratch, and so it's, it's tough to incorporate a lot more um, like correspondence data into that. But we, we also did merge it with the um, Procrope data set, which was very, very helpful in getting a lot more data included. Uh, yeah. I suppose connecting to the question about time, are you primarily looking to tell the story of the 18th century and how this phenomenon of sunnels changed or evolved, or considering kind of the sunnel phenomenon as a single thing, and here are six instances which you can then compare, or are you kind of doing both? Uh, so I would say that our primary aim really is a methodological intervention into the way that the salons are studied, because it's something that um, a lot of the scholarship on the salons doesn't, they all, they don't actually really deal as much with the, the specificities that, and the little uh, di differences over the course of the century, but also between the actual salons, because they all, they don't deal with um, the demographic data in their, in their analysis. And so we want to kind of show how the demographic data can change the picture of the salons or also confirm some of, some of the existing theories. But that being said, we also do want to, like, I think that in our conclusion, we're trying to tell a bit of a story of how things change from the earlier salons to the ones in the high enlightenment. Oh, I was wondering about the topology of the individual networks. Were those networks in which everyone knew everyone else, or the topology is different, and then you can find similarities between them, and also you can find correlations between some measurements of the network like centrality and the number of publications or something like that? 
Um, so we don't know if uh, if the people within the networks necessarily knew one another, because again, it's, the issue is that we can't know who was in the room at any given time. And of course, there there are some indications of, you know, especially the bigger names. Of course, we know you know who knew each other, but in terms of the the data set, that for the most part, we can only hypothesize that if they were in the same social network or the same. Um, knowledge network and the same salon, they might have known each other or they were more likely to know each other. Um, but I would be interested in trying to explore different ways to visualize the data and also thinking about kind of network, like visualizing it as a network and looking at issues of centrality. So it's something I've been thinking about recently. Does the data show any information about uh, excluded members, people that were uh, Due to gossip, or for any other reason, we're blacklisted. <laughs> no, but that would that would be interesting. To, if we if we had that data of, um, of someone that was maybe a member of the salon and then gets gets blacklisted, we do have um, between Dufon and the Spinaz salon. So, um, so the Spinaz was Dufon's protege, and so she had her debut in Dufon's salon, and then she actually stole many of Dufon's <laughs> attendees, and then they basically never spoke again. Um, and so we do know who she stole. But, um. <laughs> Great. Well, let's uh, please join me in thanking Chloe one more time.